Coming up next on Tech News Today, Sirius XM invested in Pandora. FAMG couldn't save tech stocks from plummeting today. Uh, Apple lets you tip creators and Apple. Boston Dynamics is moving to SoftBank. And maybe you don't want to watch The Mummy this weekend. Just saying. All that and more coming up next on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1786, recorded Friday, June 9th, 2017. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Oars and Alps, powerful skincare made for a guy's active lifestyle. Join thousands of men using Oars and Alps today. Go to oarsandalps.com slash twit to receive 15% off your first order. And by Tracker, a coin-sized tracking device that pairs with your smartphone and keeps you from losing your most valued possessions. Visit thetracker.com right now and enter promo code TNT to save 20% off any order. And by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Home plays a big role in your life. That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. It lets you apply simply and understand the entire mortgage process fully so you can be confident that you're getting the right mortgage just for you. Get started at rocketmortgage.com slash TNT. Welcome to Tech News Today. This is the show where we tell you everything you need to know about the technology stories of yep. the day. Yeah. Oh, yep. yeah. Yeah. <sighs> I'm Megan Maroney. <sighs> Are we ever? I'm Jason Howell. <laughs> you know what we did before the show? It's a first for me. Is it a first for you? I think so, yeah. Maybe not. I, I don't know. I mean, it's the best. Yeah. We organically, we made a joke. How do you compliment an ice machine, Maroney? You're crushing it. Yeah, I like it. All right. Let that spread far and wide on the internet. It's probably going to stop here, isn't it? I don't In know. Reality. I mean, the world needs more bad <laughs> jokes. <laughs> That's not a bad joke. That's a dad joke. <laughs> Top story, Sirius XM will invest $480 million in music service Pandora for a 19% stake of the company. Uh, there have been questions as to whether Sirius would outright acquire Pandora in the past, especially over the past year, uh, which has needed help for quite a while as it tries to cover the cost of its service. Uh, the deal terms prevent Sirius from purchasing any more shares from Pandora uh, for the next year and a half and more than 31.5% of the company as a whole without Pandora's board approval. So an all out acquisition unlikely to happen anytime soon. Uh, but you know, both, both Pandora and Sirius have something to gain here. Obviously Pandora is, I don't know, always trying to kind of broaden its user base and kind of exist with the big with the other big music services in the room and so kind of moving solidifying itself with drivers i'm sure is is probably a, a great way to do that or another option for them and then of course sirius xm really needs to expand into the you know increasing their internet presence and that sort of stuff yeah i mean i'm happy for both of them uh i i'm not exactly sure why it seems like pandora refuses to sell, which I guess that's great. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. they, they started this, they were there first. Right. And so it, you know, it makes sense that they just don't want to give up too much. I think uh, they will have, uh, they're giving up three of their uh, board seats, including their chairperson seat to Sirius. Um, but it, it, it seems like this is the right place for them to go because they were trying to diversify. They right. bought Ticket Fly. Um, and then they're getting rid of that. Yeah, they announced that today as well. Um, they're selling Ticketfly to Eventbrite uh, for two hundred million dollars. So they had tried to diversify. That actually sounded like a really like good um, fit. I thought, you know, mm -hmm. music service. Then you've got tickets that you can offer through. Apparently, they had a hard time kind of merging those two efforts. So yeah, and then Google announced their like tickets or Google events, mm -hmm. which I mean, they're probably once Google is doing exactly what you're doing, <laughs> it's time to find something else to do. It can be challenging, yeah. not impossible to compete with Google in these ways. But, yeah, and yeah. so it's. I mean, I I am rooting for Pandora. I'm no longer paying Pandora subscriber. I have to admit, I was for a very long time. Yeah. It's, it's cheap. It still is cheap. You were um, on the Pandora beat there for a while. I I was, I was, yeah. yeah. But now I'm full into Apple Music. But the great thing about Pandora is you could get it on your Amazon Echo. Right. You could get it in your car. You could get it on your TV. You could get it everywhere. So they obviously are good at making deals and they want to hold on to their independence. So. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Alphabet, and even Microsoft stocks fell more than 3% today. And it all started out so good for them. They got a cool new nickname from Goldman Sachs, FAMG. That's two A's. Mm. FAMG. Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, and Alphabet with the G. In other words, Goldman Sachs is still calling Alphabet Google, and they will never change doing that. <laughs> Previously, Google, Goldman Sachs had called these stocks FANG. So that was Facebook, I think Amazon, Netflix, and Google. Um, Apple wasn't in there, but now they are. Uh, it, it sounds, it's not, FANG sounds a lot cooler than FAMG. I think um, it's so like they 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 dug the the hole in having to do these acronyms with Fang, and they were like, "Well, this works out real, really well." And then they realized they need to change it. And they were like, "Oh man, we have to change it to this." We we kind of we dedicated ourselves to this acronym thing. I guess let's go there. It doesn't work quite as well. I tried it too because I I once thought when we were coming up with the show, I was like, we should have just a segment devoted to these big, yeah, uh, you know, companies, and we'll call it like Famiga <laughs> or Amaguga or something like that. I mean, there are three A's, so we could call it Triple A, but you already have a show. That's true, that, but so. I mean, maybe we don't call it G as in Google. Maybe we do call it Alphabet, and it's just Fam, right? <laughs> Because yeah. it would be three A's instead. <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> See? And we have to tilt our head like that too. Bam. Bam. Uh, <laughs> we should get to the news here that yeah. uh, Google, <laughs> Goldman Sachs, they, they called out a evaluation air pocket, which sounds like some cool new device, but it's not. It's no. uh, them basically saying like these tech stocks are not as secure as we would like them to be. And of course that made everyone go crazy and um, the stock market fall. Um, and in the actual, this group is actually down 40% from when, from last year. Um, so, and part of this is the rumors. It's always rumors like, oh, the iPhone 8 is not going to be as right. fast uh, as all these other, you know, cell phones. And so, you know, we'll, we'll see. Yeah. I mean, it all comes down, you know, the, these fluctuations and in aggregate come down to these reports. So the one you're talking about, I think was a Bloomberg report about the iPhone not being as fast as its rivals. That sent Apple shares down 3%. There was a white paper uh, that called NVIDIA a, quote, casino stock uh, and that it was not really living up to expectations there. That sent NVIDIA's stock down nearly 10%. And I guess the reverberations are felt, you know, wider than that. So mm -hmm. I'm sure it'll all recover, though. We hope. We'll see. <laughs> Virtual tip jars are getting the official green light from Apple now that it's added the new revenue stream to its App Store policy, along with Apple taking a cut of 30% in the process. Chinese live streaming video apps have long allowed for viewers to give tips and virtual gifts to the streamers uh, they enjoy watching, but it hasn't been like officially integrated. Um, it's been more of like this roundabout sort of way. Apple has been kind of uh, cracking down on that activity, partially because it's not getting a cut. You know, it's just not part of uh, the revenue model, the revenue stream. Um, so now they're essentially kind of moving it into the in-app purchase bucket, which thereby means that Apple does get a cut. Yeah, so we, uh, I was wondering how much money that YouTube was taking yeah. from their creators, and it was not easy to find. Yeah, it was Google really Assistant, difficult to find. I asked the Google Assistant on my iPhone, she sort of evaded the question. She did pull the Siri, like, here are some websites you might want to look at. She was like, um, look over there. It's a squirrel. And but we did finally find someone on Reddit had screenshotted the terms of service and it's 30%. That's oh. what Google's taking from those tips that um, I guess it used to be called fan funding. Now right. it's called super chat. Super chat. So th what they actually say is they give the creators 70%. Um, so they, they make it sound more positive. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's a tough thing. I mean, it, there it is, 70% multiplied by the greater of blah, 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 blah. If you're a creator, you should actually read those and not just say blah, 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 blah. Right. Um, yeah, I don't, uh, I, I get that it's Apple's app store, but they really work hard to keep people from finding other ways to have customers pay for stuff. Well, yeah, I think Apple wants to have an official... You know, I mean, they're, they're policing their store. It's it's their absolutely their right to do that. If there's stuff happening in the apps that they're offering up in their store, they want to make sure that it's that doesn't have the potential to take advantage. 
I'm, I'm painting it in a positive light, by the way, uh, take advantage of people. You know, they, they want to police it so that their users are protected. And oh, by the way, if you happen to be making money using your app, we gave you the spot in the app store in the first place. We gave you the ability to sell this app and to show it to people and have access to all of these millions upon millions of users. So, of course, we should get a cut because mm -hmm. we don't do anything for free. You know, <laughs> I wonder what Patreon takes, what cut they take. Do you know? Is it different? Preferred? I don't know. Mm. I'm not very familiar with the Patreon model. Mm. Let's see, if the, see Google if the assistant, assistant knows yeah. this. Mm -hmm. Let's see how many clicks. <laughs> Let's see here. Firing it off. Maybe. It's not even working. Oh, man. Ooh, wait, there it goes. How much does Patreon take from creators? And we're waiting for Here's assistance. What I found. See? Oh, here's what I found. How do you a bunch of web calculate results. fees one year? Yeah, not helpful. I just want the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't always have the answer. Uh, Patreon fee. Patreon takes 5% of successfully processed payments. Thank you, Anthony, for pulling this up. That's a better uh, deal. We only, we only take money if the creator is making money. Uh, yeah, that's a pretty darn good deal. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, different audiences, though, so that would definitely change things up. And let's just say, uh, for the record, Anthony's still smarter than the Google Assistant. Yeah, faster. Mm -hmm. I mean, and for he's now. pushing lots of buttons on the TriCaster and everything at the same time. So I'm amazed. <laughs> Our friend Brad Sams over at Throt.com says Cortana might be getting more chatty and smarter. Microsoft might give Cortana a more conversational UI. So it looks like you're texting with your digital assistant. And they might also integrate smart replies, both tools that have made Google Assistant more useful. Sometimes they might also move Cortana away from the task bar and onto the system tray where it would be harder for you to hide it. So having just uh, dipped my toes back into Windows using the Surface, not right now, the Surface book, uh, I, I got I'm getting more familiar with the, the system tray versus the task bar. And, you know, Cortana is I, I do believe it. she could be easier to use uh, on the desktop. So we will see the other thing is she's going to be able to tell you whether what you're looking at you can get cheaper somewhere else. So what we're looking at this is like a vacuum cleaner that you're looking on Home Depot. Uh, Best Buy has it a little cheaper uh, and also Amazon has it a little cheaper. So they're working directly with certain vendors. They're not going to say like here is the very cheapest place you can get it. Uh, they're working with Amazon and Walmart and eBay and 14 other uh, retailers to show you those where you might be able to get it cheaper. Yeah, that's just kind of happening in the background. You just happen to be using your, your it only works with the Edge browser. Uh, Windows 10 creators update has to be installed in order to get that, but it's just kind of happening in the background. You're browsing for a product and it pops it up. I have like an Amazon I think add-on in Chrome that anytime I'm looking at products, it gives me the Amazon price up at the top. And that oh, really? ends up being really handy because sometimes, yeah, you're looking at something and you're like, whoa, it's 30 bucks cheaper there. Like, okay. So it does that automatically? Yeah. when uh, Yes. I mean, you know, supported sites and stuff like that. Oh. But yeah, it'll pop it up. It saved me. Um, it saved me actual money uh, over time. And it's an extent, a, a Chrome browser extension from yeah. Amazon or it's a third party? I think it's from Amazon. Yeah, oh. actually. Yeah. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, tools like that, where it's just kind of monitoring, I mean, on one hand, I suppose it could walk that creepy line, but on the other hand, very, I mean, it's actually saving you money. So uh, any way that they can build Cortana in to do these very user-friendly things, I mean, you know, everyone loves to save money, mm -hmm. that's going to get you more aware of Cortana as a useful feature and, and want to use it more. So that's great. Right. And I also have to believe, though, it's um, not so good for smaller retailers. Um, well, yeah, there is that side of things, into too. The, you know, it's like the, the end caps. If you ever mm -hmm. worked in retail, you know, I worked at the Borders bookstore. Um, for those kids, ask your parents what a Borders bookstore is. Or what a bookstore is. <laughs> yeah, ask your parents what a bookstore is. <laughs> but there was the end cap and, you know, that people paid for that space. Yeah. So, and, and not everyone knows that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, finally, in light of the monster holiday hit that was the NES Classic Edition, uh, you had to know that other systems would be quick to follow. The Sega Genesis flashback console is going to scratch that itch uh, that the old school Genesis owners like myself might have, uh, thanks to a partnership with At Games. The mini console will pack 85 titles, including Sonic series, Mortal Kombat series, Fantasy Star, Altered Beast, which was, eh, meh, uh, and Michael Jackson's Moonwalker, if, in case you were keeping track, uh, instead of a super short wired controller, which is what you got with the NES Classic, the console comes with two 
2.4 gigahertz wireless controllers uh, fashioned after the original six button design with the Genesis and pre-orders for this will begin sometime this summer and ship in the fall. So, I mean, we're going to, and we're going to see more of these. I think the expectation is that somewhere close to the holiday, Nintendo is probably going to work again with the same manufacturer to put out some sort of, uh, and super Nintendo classic edition. I'd be really surprised if that didn't happen. They're all kind of doing this because they realize that retro, there's actually still money to be made around retro gaming and you package it right. You put in a, a, a nice, uh, you know, catalog of games in there. This is like double the more than double the amount of games, almost triple the amount of games that you got in the NES classic. So, uh, make it valuable and, uh, people will do it just to kind of relive their, their childhood. I think I would buy an Atari 2600. Um, okay. Classic. I would, mm -hmm. I would buy that because that was my childhood. I yeah. did not have a Nintendo. I had no Sega Genesis. That was just not, those that games. was not my bag. That those those my games game. are rough to go back to nowadays, but um, you can, uh, they do actually have some of these, the Atari flashback, as you see right here, 120 games, 120 games. that? It's at games. This is all at games. So basically this is at games working in partnership with Atari and Sega. So, and it's the same with Super Nintendo. So, or, sorry, the Nintendo, from what I understand, Nintendo didn't create the hardware. They worked with a, a third party to in, in a partnership to create to create it around the original. So they've licensed the games. There's also these portables. So Ad Games also putting out portable versions of the uh, 2600. Mm. And uh, that has 70 games built in, a portable version of the Genesis uh, slash Mega Drive. So... I don't know. Whoa, it's a well, thing. It I, continues to exist. Okay. Okay. Well, I said I would buy it. Now I have to. <laughs> now you have to. Okay. Give me a let second. Let me borrow it. Okay. If you don't mind. Okay. I wish I had it tonight. <laughs> you have one? Well, what's what do you? Well, they, so they, yes, and they do have older versions of some of these, right? So, so this is not new then, apparently, but they're they're revising them. So you got it before? Uh -oh. Oh, wow. oh wow! Okay, they're capitalizing. So this Patrick De La Hanty is is helping out here in the studio. He got them before moving here, which was definitely a few years ago. So they're capitalizing on the renewed kind of uh, attention that this whole category is even getting. You're saying more than five years ago. So so you bought it from uh, At Games. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Very similar. And what's your? Right. Do you what? What do you play on there? Adventure. Adventure. All the time. Mm. On a weekly basis, you play adventure. Oh, okay, I he hasn't plugged it in since the bring moved. it over tonight. So. <laughs> okay. yeah, it might be buried somewhere. Okay. That might be how little he plays it. Okay. A uh, quick reminder that you can comment on anything we discuss by emailing tnt at twit.tv and of course subscribe to Tech News Today by going to our show page at any time. That's twit.tv slash tnt. Up next, a return to form for Nintendo, but first. Let's take a minute to thank Oars and Alps, the sponsor of this episode and maker of your good skin. <laughs> that should not be their logo or their <laughs> slogan. I'm sure they can come up with something better, but it is time to talk about your skin. GQ calls Oars and Alps a new essential for your daily routine. It's powerful skin care. It's made for a guy's dehydrated skin and active lifestyle. If you're super active, you know, that can be rough on your skin. And that's what this, these products are all about. Oars and Alps Face Cleansing Stick, of course, is the first men's solid face wash. It's spill proof. Nothing's going to spill out of here because it's solid. You open it up, it has activated uh, charcoal that gently exfoliates and pulls impurities. See, I'll even put it on my forehead. You can kind of see it and you can just rub it right off. If you I splash a little the, water on that. I see the impurities. Do you see how, how shiny and new this part of my forehead is? Because yes. I just put it only there. Uh, the two <laughs> the two and one. I do the whole thing. It would take me a few minutes and you don't want to see that. Uh, the two and one hydrating and anti-aging face cream, uh, face and eye cream is non-greasy. It's fast absorbing, really nice stuff. And then, of course, we all need a nice deodorant. The no-nonsense natural deodorant is going to nourish your skin, absorb odor. Uh, it's everything you need out of a deodorant. Everything is super portable and TSA approved. It's made with powerful and natural ingredients that offer intense hydration. Products last up to three months, though. You can get you know a little bit more out of that depending on how you use it. Uh, Oars and Alps products were developed by two women, Laura and Mia, for their husbands. They partnered with leading chemists and created Oars and Alps to protect their husband's skin from extreme outdoor conditions that often resulted in dry and cracked skin. They took care of their husband's skin. They, they just weren't doing it themselves. Uh, so Laura and Mia also set out to solve a common problem that spilled product in gym bags. 
So they created the first solid face wash for men. All this stuff is super portable, by the way. Uh, products are perfect for to take wherever you're going. The gym, work, travel, your next adventure. Uh, the name, by the way, inspired by their husband's favorite outdoor activities. So oars as in rowing, Alps as in skiing. But really, it's perfect for whatever is your favorite. Your skincare should really keep up with your on-the-go lifestyle, and that's what it's all about. And finally, of course, yes, Father's Day is right around the corner. You still have time. You can go to uh, check out some Oars and Alps products and send it to the father in your life. They're going to love it. Oars and Alps is offering the Twit audience a fresh start to your day. Join the thousands of guys using Oars and Alps uh, by visiting oarsandalps.com slash twit. You're going to receive 15% off your first order. That's Oars and Alps, O-A-R-S. A-N-D-A-L-P-S dot com slash twit. And we thank Orson Alps for their support. Nintendo is releasing a new fighting game. It's a different type of fighting game uh, of its own on the Nintendo Switch. And it has a lot of reviewers talking. One such reviewer is Sam Iskovich from Ars Technica. How's it going? You got to put it down for the review, man. No, I need to be right on right on the topic at the moment that we're talking about. Yes, uh, <laughs> ARMS is the name of the latest Nintendo fighting game. They've only released a few over the years. There was one that came out only in Japan. And when I say fighting, I mean two-player, one-on-one, playing against each other. Uh, Smash Brothers being the one that people in the United States probably know best. Uh, it is a really hard game, is what I've uh, came to came to to say with our review that went live this week. We actually had two articles go up about it because we find this game very fascinating. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but when I think of Nintendo games in the modern era, I think of hand-holding, family friendliness, assists and boosts. Like Mario Kart has sort of an auto-steering feature now. Uh, if you're in a modern Mario game and you're doing badly, you'll get Luigi or a green mushroom or these certain extra little helper bits to help you out. ARMS is the first Nintendo game that I played in a long time that goes the total opposite direction. This is not just a fighting game. It is a punch-you-in-the-face kind of game, and it's very fascinating as a result. Yeah, I've, I've definitely felt that Nintendo, actually, for so long that I've stopped expecting otherwise, that Nintendo has been so hyper-focused on the family, nice kind kind of approach, uh, bubbly bubbly gameplay and everything, that you don't get that. So, um, But you say, yeah, this is a very difficult game. You mentioned multiple times in your article. Um, is this beating Mike Tyson level of difficulty? And is that a good thing? Is it? I, I feel like in some ways, games nowadays kind of, they do. They hold your hand a little bit as far as that's concerned. Well, nothing will ever compare to who's now known as Mr. Dream in oh, Punch-Out. Right. Come on, okay, licenses whatever. have expired, goodness. <laughs> no, yes, Tyson and Punch-Out was incredibly hard. But this game is different because it cranks its difficulty up to make you figure out its system. So the way it works is you can either play with buttons or have the Joy-Cons as motion-sensitive uh, little guys, kind of like we boxing, but not nearly as bad as we boxing. It actually can work in motion. That's a whole nother topic. Uh, and the idea is that these are your fists that you can punch and you can even turn your wrists as you punch to guide uh, your little virtual fists a little ways. And everybody in the game has these springy arms. And the idea is you can kind of stand a distance away from each other and have just enough time to read what's happening. Uh, there's also this rock, paper, scissors system of punch beats throw, throw beats do um, block, and block beats punch, because uh, those are sort of the three things. But there's also a lot of motion. And the game is at its best when you are playing it the way it wants you to, which is to move and jump and dash. These, these are button uh, commands, as in you're not moving your hands around as much for these, you're tapping a little button. And I think there is a little cognitive dis disconnect because when you first get it, you go punch, 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 because you're using your hands. And the game is trying to teach you, well, you're going to need to hit these buttons too. So it beats you and beats you and beats you until you figure out that that is how you're supposed to play it. I really struggled with the motion and moving around part of it because I was really charmed by the ability to punch and bob and weave with my hands uh, using actual motion as opposed to tapping buttons. So that's sort of what was tricky about it. And there's no real tutorial. There's no one who comes in and says, hey, 
We're going to walk you through all of these different things. Every character has sort of different powers. Uh, every character has different fists, and each fist has different powers as well. There's a bunch of systems that the game just does not bother teaching you. And I'm not sure that that's the right way to go. I do think there could have been room for perhaps, you know, a little boxing gym sort of thing. I certainly wouldn't go up against a real boxer in real life without having some sort of training. <laughs> and I think Nintendo does drop players in a little bit as a result of that. How was the workout uh, as compared to, say, like Wii Tennis? Well, I mean, Wii Tennis is the kind where you can just do this and that's mm -hmm. it. Like, you you don't, you, people kind of hacked it to figure out, oh, if I'm just barely moving my wrist. <laughs> Sorry about that for the webcam viewers, how that looked. <laughs> uh, how, uh, but, but this is a little bit, you don't have to move a lot. You can, you can use it, but you do have to use a little bit more discrete motion. Uh, it's definitely not like virtual reality where you're bopping, weaving. You can, you can sit still. Uh, it's definitely not about uh, physical fitness as much as mental because you really do have to bob, weave, move, and use every button possibility all combined all the time. You have to be at the top of your mind game in order to do any, anything in this game. And uh, you, you even mentioned in the article, I have to imagine, I, I would have just assumed this happens all the time, but uh, apparently not. The game actually had you shout out, yes, so loud that your neighbors heard it. And I mean, I remember playing games as a kid and like you got that accomplishment and like you couldn't help it. You had to scream because you were so proud of yourself. Um, wh what, it, what is that? Is that? Is that a quality that's missing from games nowadays? Well, as a man child, I find that I have very few opportunities to genuinely be excited right. that way by a game system. Uh, I don't know that that's missing. I just think it is a specific kind of game system. And some people want that. They want to yeah. get into a game and master it and have a giant mountain to climb and have that be this thing that fits into their digital entertainment life. Other people don't necessarily want a game that beats the crap out of them, that really punishes them for bad jumps or bad little tiny twitchy things. There's room for all that kind of stuff. But what I found really interesting about this was I grew to really appreciate and like the world of the game, which is a new world. This is These are all brand new characters uh, by going trial by fire. And that reminded me of how much I fell in love with specific characters and universes from Nintendo in that mid to late 80s period when things were still really hard. This was before Super Mario Brothers 2 came out and it was different in the United States than it was in Japan. The Japanese one was brutally hard. The American one was a totally different game that was turned into Mario that was similar but much easier and softer. And I feel like a lot of that has gone away. And this is also a Nintendo that just takes its old characters and slaps them into new things and rehashes and rehashes and rehashes. Mm -hmm. But I think we're seeing a Nintendo whose younger developers are being encouraged to make new stuff, to try new things, including games that are super hard and don't necessarily teach you. And I think that is exciting because Nintendo, when they are really encouraging that sort of game creation creativity, they're, they, they are unstoppable at their best. Yeah, that game looks great. Uh, one of my favorites when I was a kid is the Sonic series, and Sega has a return uh, to Sonic's 2D form on the way in Sonic Mania. You spent some time with the game. Tell us a little bit about it. That's right. There was a E3 Judges Week, so we big shots get to try out some games ahead of E3, mm -hmm. which is coming up this week. And thank you. Thank you. Yes. And <laughs> uh, Sonic Mania was one of the smaller ones, but it wound up being one of the more captivating ones for me. Now, this is a rebirth of the 2D Sega Genesis style of Sonic the Hedgehog. So everything looks kind of 16-bit and pixelated and animated as such. And it takes levels from the other games, zones, pardon me, from the other games and rebuilds them. And this is what I call it is a fanboy development team. There are some uh, huge fans in the Sonic modding community. These are people who take older Sonic games, use their computers and tweak them, add new levels, all that sort of thing. And Sega has been working with a few of these really good modders for some time, grouped them together and said, go ahead, make a new game based on the old ones. And I've played little bits and pieces over the past year. It comes out this August. Um, and I it, finally, it's pretty much done. And I got to just sit for 30 minutes and play seven of the levels. And these were jumping from different parts of the Sonic universe. And what I found was uh, the thing that I loved about Sonic games in the older days 
was that they understood, even though you can go really, really fast and just have that woo blast processing sort of feel that they advertised back in the day, these are games that are actually this interesting mix of go real fast, but also keep an eye out for sneaky paths, for interesting options for getting around. It's all about high-speed, crazy traversal. And I think Mario games have never been as much about that sort of maximize your path, maximize your runtime, uh, speed all over the place. And this is a series of levels that I've played that are like, they just feel like old 16-bit Sonic in a way that the 3D games lost. With more 3D stuff, they didn't focus you on that really cool ability to just run real fast and find cool paths. So I really, really like how Sonic Mania is looking. Nice. And there's no, like, I, I feel like when I was watching this promo that there were some parts of levels that I recognize. There's no callbacks to older levels. It's all brand new, uh, brand new levels, new content, right? So these are occasionally it'll be a little thing like the metallic roller coasters in the chemical plant zone. Uh, the Green Hill Zone is the one that's in almost every game, and that's yeah. the one that starts out. Uh, but no, these are essentially new. There's some new items. There's some new sort of ways that the levels fall apart and come together. Uh, one of my favorites is Chemical Plant has this new thing now where you'll see a little pool of water and you'll find out that, oh, you can dump chemicals into the water and it turns into a bouncy pool. The more chemicals you get in the water, the bouncier it gets. And then it's a trick of, oh, how do I add more chemicals to that water? Uh, and that was just an interesting little puzzle that just emerged as I played and ran around. I would run real fast, see a pool above my head, go back to the level and go, oh, I want to I want to add chemicals to that and see what happens. And I wound up getting a much faster, cooler route just by feeling that out. So I really like the idea of playing repeatedly, getting that time down, getting the score up, that very old school challenge thing, kind of like what I was talking about with arms. Yeah. Right on. Uh, sounds great. I will definitely want to check that out. And my daughter, uh, my seven-year-old daughter, is a new fan of of these old-school video games. Uh, Sonic is her favorite, so I'm sure she'll play this too. Yeah, she'll be into this. Even if the game came out as I played it incomplete, I would say it's totally worth the 20 bucks. that it's going to be on Xbox One, PlayStation 4, Nintendo Switch, and Windows PCs. Nice. So 20 bucks on any of those. you got a lot of different ways to get into it. I highly recommend jumping on it in mid-August. Awesome. Uh, and finally, you took one for the team. You went to see The Mummy in theaters and your words seem to confirm my assumptions. Tell us a little bit about uh, your amazing movie night. Uh, yeah. The headline I opted for was, don't change your plans to not see The Mummy. Uh, I feel like a lot of people have looked at the trailers and looked at the buzz and been sort of, eh. I had a little bit of hope because Tom Cruise, time and time again, keeps on starring in movies that are quite good. Uh, more than one Mission Impossible movie, more than one Jack Reacher movie. I mean, he's there was that one, uh, Edge of Tomorrow, I think is the name, where he just died over and over, and that was fun. Uh, so I'm like, okay, maybe this weird cockamamie reboot of The Mummy without Brendan Fraser would be good. Not so much. In fact, I would say this is the worst Tom Cruise starring role I have seen in a decade. He is wow. awful. He comes off as, it's like he just marathoned a bunch of Saved by the Bell episodes and says, I'm going to pretend to be that Zach Morris guy. He tries to be charming and devious and sneaky as this sort of uh, Nathan Drake ripoff. Uh, Nathan Drake being the star of the Uncharted video games. Mm -hmm. And he fails at that. All he does is kind of smirk and squint and stare longingly into the distance. That's really bad. His primary leading lady actress is completely stuck on his character, either hating him or doting on him. And so she has no room to operate outside of the really piddly script she's given. They are, they dominate the runtime. And that's a bummer because there's actually an incredible digital VFX team at work here. The mummy herself, uh, she is portrayed incredibly between the really steely-eyed acting and the uh, visual effects that she is just smothered in. She just looks awesome uh, as her body is like falling apart and decaying. And there's all <laughs> these other undead creatures that also look really commanding and scary and creepy. And when it feels like an old universal monster movie, which I know they're trying to, to go toward, that's cool. But you don't get to root for the mummy. You're too busy being bummed out that Tom Cruise is dominating everything. Uh, so that's a bummer. Oh, and Russell Crowe is actually quite good, which was shocking. Although that might have just been in comparison to how bad Tom Cruise was. All I can really hope for is that um, I look great falling apart and when my body's decaying. That's, that's <laughs> what I hope for. I feel like it might be worth it just to see that. There's some, I mean, if that's the way you want to go, I should just warn you, head you off the pass. There's some stuff she does in the movie that is still incredibly disgusting. So okay. you know, I'm absolutely not going to see this, nor did I see any of the other mummy movies. And I think I'm okay. 
Well, Without the Brendan Fraser ones really understood that you 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 want to root for that lead crazy bumbling guy, and he took a few minutes into his uh, mummy films and just nailed it. It's like, all right, we're gonna hang out with this guy. We buy it. Tom Cruise does not know how to be a likable human being, and that worked out fine when he was the steely-eyed leader of a ragtag group of other good actors. But he doesn't get that privilege here. He's stuck by himself, sucking. Right, surrounded by the dead. And even with all of that life that he has, it's not enough. Um, what does this say about Universal Studios' uh, Dark Universe franchise, which this is kind I of mean, like the kickoff for that? The dumb universe. They tried uh, doing this before with a, with a uh, Dracula-themed movie that didn't quite... They actually removed the scenes that would have made it Dark Universe at the time because that one was so bad. And this, yeah, it bodes very badly. Uh, unless... Something is totally wiped after this movie. If somehow the studio hears, oh, Tom Cruise stunk, but the rest of it was good, let's just do it differently. I think they're just going to hear a loud and clear signal that audiences hated this movie and therefore don't want a universe. So I don't see it really boding well for the ones that are going to star like Johnny Depp. Hmm, interesting. Uh, well, we will certainly find out. I'm probably not going to watch this either. I don't no, I'm behind. I haven't even seen Wonder Woman yet. I'm I, I'm embarrassed. Yeah, to go say. see Wonder Woman. If for any reason you're like, I need to see a movie this weekend, just see Wonder Woman. Yeah, is that not like... only is it good on its own, it's just that much better than the Mummy. <laughs> that should be on the poster. <laughs> Way better than the Mummy. I mean, that doesn't take much. <laughs> <laughs> Sam Skovich from Mars Technica. Always great to get you on, man. Thank you so much. All right, I'm going to get back to work. Get, get back to your game plan. All right, have a good night. After the break, robots, Kushners, and Pinterest. But first, let's take a minute to thank Tracker, the sponsor of this episode. There is a ritual to looking for your keys. First, you check the obvious places, your couch, your kitchen, your pockets, the weird places, the bathroom, the fridge, the hamper. Then you start getting creative. I'm looking at you, peanut butter jar. Eight years ago, Tracker changed everything when they released their first tracking device, and now they've done it again with the all-new Tracker Pixel. It's a little bit smaller than the other one, and it has a light, which I'm so excited about, because then you can find things or find people or just feel like you have a light attached to your keys if you're in the dark, and you'll never worry about losing your things again. Tracker Pixel is the lightest Bluetooth tracking device on the market. Place Tracker Pixel on whatever you tend to lose. Keys, wallets, even your cat. It's small enough to fit on your smallest items. When you misplace an item that has a tracker pixel attached, use your smartphone and a 90 decibel alert will help you find it in just seconds. It also has that powerful LED light that I just told you about so you can find your items in the dark. If you lose your phone, you just press the button on your tracker pixel and your phone rings even if it's on silent. You can locate your item if it's miles away because every Tracker user is part of the largest crowd locate network in the world. And Tracker's 30-day money-back guarantee means you truly have nothing to lose. Get it? Nothing to lose. Go to thetracker.com, enter promo code TNT, and you can save 20% off any order. That's T-H-E-T-R-A-C-K-R.com, promo code TNT for 20% off. You know how much we love robots on this show, especially Boston Dynamics robots that have been entertaining or terrifying us in YouTube videos for years. We'd heard that parent company Alphabet was looking for a buyer for Boston Dynamics, and it appears that they found one. Joining us to talk about this story and a few other stories she's been covering this week is Ellen Hewitt from Bloomberg. Welcome to the show, Ellen. Thanks for having me. So who now owns our future ro robot overlords? So Boston Dynamics used to be owned by Alphabet slash Google. Uh, for a long time. And a year ago, I think it was even um, our own Gladstone at Bloomberg who had the scoop first, which was that Google was looking to sell Boston Dynamics. And it had been sort of a marquee part of Google's purchase of all these robotics companies. Um, and uh, they sold it to SoftBank. So that's, you know, that's who owns it now. It's really unclear who is going to be or, or really how Boston Dynamics is going to fit within SoftBank if it's going to be part of the regular company or part of its vision fund, which is a, a, you know, an enormous fund that they've been using to invest in a lot of Valley startups. Um, but I think what will remain is Boston Dynamics has always been kind of this individual place where they've made these really freaky and really powerful robots um, that really maybe don't have that much commercial um, application right now. That was a major problem for Alphabet. And a reason, you know, that they wanted to sell was that it, it really didn't fit in with the rest of the business of Google, no matter how interesting it was or no matter how many 
YouTube views the videos that demonstrate their robots got. And that was a lot because they are really interesting to watch. Yeah, but they weren't really uh, selling them. And I guess it was also, they, they were not great for Google's image, right? Because whenever anyone saw them, they immediately thought like, oh, that robot could kill a person pretty quickly. Is that what Google's planning on doing? <laughs> it's certainly unsettling to watch them. I think they are also super interesting. Uh, and But yeah, I think the, the major problem I imagine was that the commercial application is not so obvious. And in the last couple of years, um, since Google has really reshaped itself as Alphabet and these other bets, then you've seen Google kind of pair back and, and pull back resources from some of its side bets that have been a little bit more moonshotty than others, uh, one of which being the robotics division, which has sort of been broken up. It used to be something that they'd put together um, with the hopes of having Andy Rubin, the creator of Android, run something, but he has left Google, um, left Alphabet, and, and you're seeing this slow process of Alphabet sort of selling off some of the parts of Google that we once thought of as kind of the weird, cool things that they do. Uh, they, they maybe don't have a home at Alphabet anymore. It's kind of amazing how how quickly the the march to robots literally from Google like halted the second Andy Rubin kind of walked out, stepped out the door. It was almost immediately like, well, I guess maybe we should do something else. Um, one thing that I've loved about Boston Dynamics, as, as we were talking about, is the fact that they're so open, they're so willing to share the work that they're doing uh, you know, on YouTube so people can watch it. Is there any, I don't know, any indication from what we know about SoftBank to know whether they're more likely to keep these advancements close to their chest or, or I don't know. I just don't want, I don't want these videos to go away. I want to know about these <laughs> robots. Um, I think that, uh, you know, maybe that just depends on sort of how the leadership within Boston Dynamics is going to fit in with SoftBank. I know it sounds like um, SoftBank's leaders and management are really interested in what robotics can do, and they seem really enthusiastic about the future that we could have with smart robotics, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I imagine maybe they'd be eager to show off uh, what the company could do under their uh, corporate umbrella, but we'll have to wait and see. Yeah. Now, is SoftBank like a Google, um, or is it more, is it smaller than that? It, what, what could you compare it to? I mean, it's huge. And if you if recently the role that they've been playing in Silicon Valley has been really um, in investing in these startups and it has this enormous um, vision fund, which has, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars, I think has a lot of money and it's been putting a lot of money into startups. And actually what's been interesting is seeing the ripple effect that that's been having is, in fact, you know, sometimes when the vision fund comes in and says, you know, SoftBank wants to put X number of dollars in your startup. And the startup actually says, actually, you know, we want less or, you know, we don't want to sell as much of the company. Um, there's so much money in this fund that they've been really putting in that money kind of sometimes over the protests of the companies themselves. And it's been rising valuations for a lot of startups. It's sort of an interesting dynamic within the startup scene where, where this company has so much money to invest um, in, in other companies that's been changing the regular dynamics of venture investing. So let's move on to another story that you reported this week. It's not new that many tech executives first meet each other at Harvard, where they go not just for the education, but for the connections. But sometimes those connections can get complicated when one of those connections ends up marrying the president's daughter. Tell us about this story that you reported this week. Right. So the story is about Cadre, which is a startup that runs a platform that lets accredited investors invest in commercial real estate. So this is usually an asset class that you can only have access to if you are paying into a real estate fund or something like that. But with this platform, you could maybe buy a very small slice of an apartment building or retail building. Um, you know, real estate tends to have high risk, but high yield. So it's an asset class a lot of people want to get into. Um, that's kind of the, the straightforward pitch. The complicating factor is that the CEO, Ryan Williams, is um, a guy who went to Harvard two years behind Josh Kushner, um, met Josh at Harvard, became close through Josh with his brother, Jared Kushner. Um, and the three of them actually co-founded the company, although Ryan is the CEO and he's the one who kind of does most of the day-to-day -day business. But he said in an interview with us this week that, you know, he considers both brothers to be co-founders. Um, Josh is really involved because Thrive Capital, which is, a, a, you know, the firm where Josh is a partner, uh, is an investor and Josh is on the board. Um, Jared is also, you know, considered a co-founder, but is less involved now. He had a board seat, but stepped down. He had a stake. He sold some of it. And it, that's where it gets touchy because Jared Kushner, you know, was reported about a month ago that Jared Kushner still has a stake in Cadre. 
but did not disclose it in sort of the standard way when he was um, disclosing all of the stakes that he held. And this is important because he's a senior advisor to Trump. People are supposed to know where um, his ties are business-wise. Um, and so this kind of put a bit of scrutiny on Cadre. People were asking themselves, you know, what is this company? And it also had recently raised a, a fairly large round. So, you know, we reported it was $65 million led by Andreessen Horowitz at a valuation of more than $800 million. So, so like a, a fairly high-profile startup, but then with this additional complication of like, you know, how, you know, is Jared still involved? How is Josh involved? Is this um, any sort of conflict of interest? Like people have definitely been paying attention to what this uh, connection is and really what the details of it are. I got the sense from reading your article that they were sort of trying to distance themselves now uh, from the Kushners. Yeah, I would say that's definitely true. I mean, it's it's complicated. It's a complicated dance for Cadre because as the CEO told me, Jared and Josh's connections when they first started the company were essential to helping it get the right networks, get the right investors. Um, you know, they, you know, there's no one more connected in real estate than than the Kushners. So to have two of them as a co-founder is a huge boon. However, things get complicated when when Trump became president. So then, you know, I think you could look at the company's press release about their funding round, and they did not mention the Kushners at all. So this is this was, um, I think, they're trying to make it clear that the company stands separately from the brothers. However, you know, the CEO told me Josh is super involved. He, they talk on the phone once or twice a week. He's still on the board. He still has a stake through Thrive Capital. He's like calling him up and giving him product advice and stuff. So it's kind of hard. I think they want to have both, you know, this strong connection that really helps the business, not drawing too much attention to uh, the complications of being connected to uh, the president. Well, I know Joshua Kushner came out and said, you know, right after Trump was elected, like, I am not involved and really tried to separate himself and Thrive Capital. But it's complicated. I mean, part of one of the um, in, uh, Thrive Capital is a big investor in like a healthcare startup that was designed to help people navigate uh, how to get health care, which is, of course, now in the hands of Trump and Kushner. And it seems like it would be impossible not to have a conflict of interest, even if he's staying up and saying, I'm not involved. Yeah, I think the conflict of interests can be found in a lot of different companies. And yes, anything that has to do with healthcare is going to be extra sensitive. You know, there's regulations in a lot of industries. And I think um, basically, you know, and with the case of Cadre, it was really helpful to have the Kushners involved basically until more recently in which it became very complicated. So I think there there may be other Kushner connected businesses and, and they are connected in a lot of ways to a lot of different businesses and industries that may feel like, ah, actually things are kind of complex now that um, Donald Trump is president. Well, you cover startups for Bloomberg and uh, you reported this week on funding for Pinterest, which I don't think of as a startup, but it seems to be raising money like one. Can you tell us about this news? Yeah, so we had a scoop today, um, not today, a few days ago that Pinterest was raising $150 million. Uh, and it's been more than two years since they last raised. The sh preferred share price is the same. So in, in our eyes, that was what you might call a flat round. Um, Pinterest actually disputed this in a particular way where they said, well, you know, because we've issued more shares, the total valuation of the company is higher. I kind of think that that's, personally, I think it's a little misleading. People tend to think of an up round as the actual share price increasing in value over time. But anyway, yes, Pinterest still startup, still raising money. I think this, you know, the significance of this is, you know, Pinterest has talked a lot about, and there's been expectations that they would go public sometime. To me and to people who follow Pinterest closely, I think the idea that they would continue to raise money suggests they're not quite ready or that they don't have the business model um, at a mature level where they can be making the kind of money where they don't need to be raising outside capital. So to us, it was kind of a significant story in that in that Pinterest was both raising money at all. And then secondly, that they were um, continuing to do it at kind of the same level that they'd been doing a couple of years ago. You know, they have been trying to expand, um, you know, some of their advertising opportunities. And people tend to think Pinterest has a good place for this because people go there with the intent to buy and look for products. And, you know, uh, that's a good place to be advertising. But it seems like this signals maybe things are not working out the way that they thought they would be. Yeah, that's that's kind of my question with Pinterest is that, it, I mean, it's been around so long and it, like it's just kind of a, a, a staple in the social media world. It's definitely, you know, a social media network that a lot of people have used, but so many of the other networks seem to be propelling so much, you know, skyrocketing quicker 
faster than Pinterest is. It's just kind of going slow and steady. Is it a quality of ad network sort of thing? I know some, you know, I've, I've read a lot of feedback from people who just say the, the quality of the ads aren't that good uh, on the network. Yeah. And, yeah. I mean, I think what they're trying to do and, and the way that they're trying to improve this is by improving their visual search. They have some pretty powerful right. um, technology that allows you to take photos of items and then search for similar items or images on Pinterest. Whether that's going to pan out into better advertising revenue, I don't know. You're totally right. There are other, um, you know, Instagram is a great sort of example of a competitor where I think growth has really continued at a stronger pace than it has at Pinterest. They have more monthly active users, um, you know, and I think that just means more eyes against which you can sell advertising. And so it's unclear to me whether the technological advances that Pinterest is trying to incorporate uh, are going to help it be more, uh, you know, get more revenue from ads um, as compared to some of its other competitors. Yeah. Yeah, it makes you wonder if Instagram had stayed independent, not been bought by Facebook, if they would have tried to have done this now. And it, because right, right yeah. now <laughs> it is totally seamless to buy something that you see on Instagram versus Pinterest. I always feel like I'm, you know, I'm I'm stuck in this. You know, I'm never taken to where I want to go immediately. Yeah, you're. <laughs> that's my that's my, one of my complaints with Pinterest. It's like, oh yeah, I want to go to that thing, and I click it, and it didn't actually take me to the thing I wanted to go to. It took me to a great a, a whole new list of things mm -hmm. that look like it. And I'm like, I never know what I'm doing here. What am I doing here? Other than like shaming myself for the fact that I can't quite make that look as good as you made that. Look. Yeah, exactly. Pinterest. There's is a really lot of good. Pinterest shame. Yeah, yeah we deal with it very all the time. Yeah. Well, Ellen, thank you so much for joining us. Ellen Hewitt <laughs> is a reporter at Bloomberg. Uh, where, where's the best place to follow you online? You can find me on Twitter at Ellen Hewitt, last name H-U-E-T. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ellen. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Take care. Have a great night. Last week, we pondered how much our information was worth to companies like Facebook or Google. And Doug wrote in to tell us what it might be worth to hackers. He sent us a slide presented at a re recent Cisco event that gave some indication of what our hacked information is worth. So I, I'm not sure if um, you can really understand the slide. And if you're just listening, you probably can't see it. Um, <laughs> but it looks like uh, $50 for every 500,000 emails. Um, mobile malware is $150. Oh, wow. This is fascinating. Your, your credit card data can range between $0.25 cents and $60. Uh, and your bank account info uh, is less than $1,000. So this uh, was obviously it was developed it was you know at a at an event by a Cisco employee um, trying to you know push their tools. But Facebook account a dollar for an account with fifteen friends. So what wow. you know, what, what okay. happens with you know? So I guess that that is that's interesting. That is in, that's the hackers. Welcome to the hackers economy. Monetizing the influence of that Facebook account. I don't know exploits one thousand to three hundred thousand. That's that's the business you go into if you're a, if you're a hacker looking to make money. I suppose is developing those exploits. But that's why they go for so much. You know that's why you know the U.S. government is willing to pay X amount of dollars for an exploit to get into the iPhone. Like mm -hmm. there's, they unlock so many things uh, as a result. So of course they carry a high price tag. Mm -hmm. I think I said that the bank account was worth less than, I'm not sure what that means. It's a, it's greater than, it's less than a thousand dollars. It's pointing at a thousand dollars, but I don't know what that means exactly. What, what's, what's worth. It, what's worth what in what, that the equation? Bank account, yeah. <laughs> is, is it a bank account with less than a thousand dollars is worth something? I'm not <sighs> sure. After the break, when good volume sliders go bad. But first, let's take a minute to thank Rocket Mortgage, the sponsor of this episode. The mortgage experience wasn't keeping up with the times. It was dated and it needed a client-focused technological revolution. That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. Rocket Mortgage gives you the confidence you need when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing loan. It's simple, allowing you to fully understand all the details and be confident you're getting the right mortgage for you. It's nerve wracking getting a house. You wanna make sure that you have a mortgage that you can afford. It's convenient. They are trusted partners, allow you to share your financial information with Rocket Mortgage at the touch of a button. So you can do it on your iPad, do it on your iPhone, do it on your Android phone, do it on your laptop, anywhere 
you are connected to the internet, you have Rocket Mortgage. It's also powerful. So whether you're looking to buy your first home or your 10th, Rocket Mortgage is able to perform thousands of calculations in seconds. You do not have to do that math on your own. Based on your income, assets, and credit, Rocket Mortgage can analyze all of your home loan options for which you qualify and then find the one that's right for you. So they do the hard work and show you what's available to you so you can get the home that you've always dreamed of. Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Apply simply, understand fully, mortgage confidently. To get started, all you have to do is go to rocketmortgage.com slash TNT. That's rocketmortgage.com slash TNT. Add the TNT on the end of that, that way that they know that we sent you there. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, NMLS, consumeraccess.org, number 3030. And we thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for their support of tech news today. All right, TNT's fan of the day is to Johnson, who sent us these photos, two pictures uh, of his whole family, I'm assuming, listening to Tech News Today on their Bluetooth speaker while at the beach, because that's what you do. You go to the beach and you listen to our show as a family. Mm -hmm. we're, we're saying this all the time. Take us to the beach with you and listen to us while you're there with your family. I feel like we say that like day in, day out. <laughs> well, what else would you do on the beach with your family? Yeah, you certainly wouldn't be digging digging in the sand or, or splashing mm -hmm. through the waves. Mm -hmm. No, you're listening to us. And we applaud you for mm -hmm. that. Uh, show us how you watch or listen to TNT. Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup. You post it on Instagram, Google+, Twitter, or Facebook. And use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT and we'll find it. At our house, we have a coffee table book called The Museum of Bad Art. It's from The Museum of Bad Art. And after seeing the following post on Designer News, I feel like someone needs to create a museum of bad web UI. Yes. After developers realized that Apple decided to change its volume control in iOS 11, Redditors on the Programmer Humor subreddit decided to have a contest to create the world the worst, worst possible volume slider. Here are some of the results. That's good. So it is, so it pulls up. Well, this will be hard to describe for the audio listeners. <laughs> yeah. It pulls up a normal in, a, in a, a video player a normal volume slider, but instead of going all the way up and down, it's to the side, the very small, narrow, like depth. <laughs> it probably has like five steps in it. Um, <laughs> this is. I don't even know how we describe this for the audio listeners. This is a hard task. <laughs> you gotta watch it. You gotta yeah. go to the subreddit. This looks sort of like maybe a cannonball. Yeah, almost shooting. like you're shooting a cannon. Yeah. Yeah. The, the the speaker icon is a cannonball shooting out the little dot for the volume slider. And wherever it lands, that's how loud it is. Uh, another one where you make a noise as loud as you want the volume to be. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I want. <laughs> so you have to yell yeah. and, or, or whisper. And this is my favorite, actually. A bunch of random dots on a play field here. And it starts out randomly. You have to construct out of those dots the number that you want to turn the volume. But that's not it. Once you have the number constructed, then you have to draw a box around it to say, this is the number that I want the volume to be. And it turns the volume there. There's a bunch of really great ones. Yeah. I, I was so happy you picked this because I saw this the day before. And I was like, dang, I don't have the kicker tomorrow. Mm -hmm. If I did, I'd totally oh, go with this we one. We were thinking the same thing. Yes. Yeah, uh, there's is... also an Arduino glove that lets you. That's the second um, a video, uh, what does Anthony. It do? It's uh, you, <laughs> you plug in... Is that the same link? That's the other link, right? You can see you, the video will, um, you'll see the Arduino glove there. <laughs> okay. I think that so you- This is to control your volume still? Yes. <laughs> and you put on the Arduino glove. Right. Because volume control needs to be harder than it already is. <laughs> this is just proving that you can. Yes. I'm Plug it in. And then what, what do you do? Then you can use it, your hand to turn the volume up. Oh. Like, uh, that's like a Star Wars thing, right? Like your Darth <laughs> that's, Vader. That's in the future. You won't need a glove. You'll just go, turn it up. Right. Put it down. You'd be like, that's mm -hmm. like, turn it down a little bit. It's a little too loud. How do you turn the volume up and down on your Google Home? Like, can you, what do you say? Uh, hey, G, turn up. Hey, G, turn down. Yeah. You, that's what hey, you do. Hey, G, shut up. I did that the other day and it and totally it works. Stopped? Yes. Oh, it's teaching people to be rude. <laughs> I was trying to concentrate and it was, it was playing so I was like, hey, G, shut up. And it totally shut stopped. Up. And I felt so bad. Rude. I felt bad. But yeah. then I realized it doesn't have any emotions. So it doesn't matter. Mm hmm. Well, on the Yet. Echo, it's like volume 10 or volume 8. Or yeah, volume, you can do that yeah. too, I think. I don't know what the number scale is, though. I don't either. Is it I don't, between 10 is 100 the loudest. or is it between 10? 10 is the loudest for the Amazon Echo, oh, okay. and it's not very loud. 
Okay. Hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, OKG max volume. That would probably work. Yeah, there are ways to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I love that list, though. Go check it out. It's definitely more visual than it is us describing it to you. It's worth it, uh, worth checking out. TNT records live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, 2300 UTC at twit.tv slash live. Be part of the show by emailing us, tnt at twit.tv. Leave us a short voicemail, 260-TNT-SHOW. And find us on Twitter, at Tech News Today TV. We are also at the Tech News Today subreddit, although I'm going to be hanging out more often at the Programmer Humor subreddit now that that seems to be where it's happening. But also <laughs> stop the by the, the technewstoday.reddit.com and you can comment on any of the stories that we talk about or add your own. And you can find all the ways to subscribe to our show at twit.tv slash TNT. It's available wherever podcasts are found, so you can get us anywhere. And if you want to tweet at me, I'm at Megan Maroney. And I'm at Jason Howell on Twitter. Uh, thanks to Anthony, our TD for the day. Appreciate it. Thanks to Patrick and Alex for helping out in the studio. Thanks to Kevin for editing the show. And thanks to you for talking tech with us today and all week. We appreciate you being here every single day. We'll see you all on Monday. Have a great weekend, everybody. Bye.